open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Um, and I, I'm sorry, everyone joining us online, sorry I didn't welcome you as well earlier. It's great to be with you all as well, and we're so happy you're with us, uh, really, truly. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're continuing through the book, and as you'll see, we're starting to wrap up. It's hard to believe that it's already been a couple of months, and um, we'll be done with Thessalonians in a couple of weeks now. And on November 28th, we'll be starting our Advent series, our Christmas series, leading up to the expectation of waiting for Jesus, uh, which I really look forward to. But first, uh, we got to get to where we're at. So, 1 Thessalonians 4, we're going to be reading verses 9, 9 through 18. Um, you're welcome to follow along on the screen. There's a Bible in the chair in front of you as well, if you want to uh, follow along or have that open while I'm talking. I get it. Okay. Chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 9 through to 18, Paul writes, Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. Paul continues, verse 13, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, for you ha for who have no hope. Verse 14, so we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Okay, got it? Easy, right? Um, I'll just let me give you a quick overview of verses 9 to 12 real quick. Um, I love this verse. should mind your own business, okay? So that's that. But then we get to this next section where dead and sleeping and alive and Jesus coming back and trumpets. Okay. Um, so in the church, the big word for this is eschatology, end times theology, the book of Revelation. I almost knocked my Bible over. Um, that's what we're talking about here. And then there's another word that has become sort of popular called the rapture, right? How many people have heard this word? How many people have ever gone into a really deep study of this stuff and, and really tried to figure it out? Anyone? It kind of consumes your life. Yeah, I'm raising my hand because I've spent a lot of time looking at this stuff and reading Revelation and saying, okay, horsemen and lamps and stands and beasts and dragons and what's happening? All right. Um, some of us were mostly influenced by this. Do, anyone remember or, or uh, recognize this picture? You remember these? Yeah, okay, how many people, let's be honest, how many people read at least one Left Behind book? Okay, great. Um, so, this passage talks about this event. Jesus, at some point, is going to return with clouds and take us up to him, and this is what these books are about. Now, I have good news and bad news. These books, while entertaining, or the movie, if you saw, I think there's a couple of reiterations of the movie. Um, they're not bad. If you like them, they're good. I remember liking them. But I have really, really bad news for some of you. Um, these are novels. Okay, these are not in-depth, scholarly, exegetical, exegesis of Scripture. Um, and I know I sort of picked on the book I Kissed Dating Goodbye last week uh, by Joshua Harris, so I'm going to pick on these a little bit. Um, in a bad way, a lot of us have actually had our theology of thinking about the end times formed by fiction. Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about today, really, I want to talk about this idea of the second coming of Jesus or the rapture, or however you want to phrase it, um, because this idea actually is relatively new to the church. This idea of us going to be with God and focusing on these ideas and this whole, like, us <laughs> disappearing and clothes being left on the ground is sort of new. It's new to the last 300 years or so where people have really obsessed over this. Um, but it's become a really big deal because why? We want to know. Like, we want to know. Our culture is all about knowing who, what, where, when, why, how, right? How, when is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? What does it look like? How do I know? And some recent history about this, um, 
that's really helpful to know is people, especially for the last 150, 200 years, have really been trying to predict when the end of the world is going to come, right? They look at the news, they look at the Bible, they look at numbers in the Bible, they're trying to crack the code, right? So let me just give you some recent history of the last 150, 200 years. In 1844, there was a preacher named William Miller who predicted that Christ would return between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. And then when it didn't happen, he pushed it back a little bit to October. <laughs> but it didn't happen, and everyone said, okay, you're wrong. Go away. Uh, a little bit later, um, some of you may know uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the ones that come around and knock on your door. And um, in 1914, 1918, and 1925, independently, they all sort of tried to figure out, and the Jehovah's Witnesses claimed that Jesus was coming back. Didn't happen. 1978, some of you may remember this. Uh, Calvary Chapel founder Chuck Smith predicted Jesus would probably return by 1981. Jesus is late. Um, 1988, uh, uh, this, is a, this is an interesting one. An engineer for NASA and a Bible student as well decided that there could be a mathematical code in this book that he could construct to figure out when Jesus was coming back. And it was a very convenient title. He published a book, 88 Reasons Why, God, Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. Very nice how that wrapped together. See how that worked? Um, how many of you remember 1989? Okay, didn't happen. Uh, 1994, Harold Camping, a famous Christian radio host, predicted 6th of September, 94, didn't happen. He then revised it, went back and did the research, and then revised it to, to May 2011. And after that didn't happen, he said that the rapture would occur on the 21st of October 2011, and then that didn't happen, and everyone said, okay, we're going to stop listening to you. And yet... You can go online and you can find predictions. You can find a prediction for six months from now. You can find a prediction for next year. You can find a prediction for five years. You know? People love talking about this stuff. We want to know, Jesus, when are you going to come back? But we're still here, aren't we? Even in Jesus' time in 70 AD, um, 40 years after Jesus, give or take, the Romans came in because of an uprising and destroyed the temple and all the Christians thought, okay, now it's happening. So let me be clear about a couple of things. One, we believe as Christians, we've talked about this in recent weeks, Jesus ascended into the heavenly realms next to God. In Acts chapter 1, Scripture tells us that Jesus, the disciples, watched him go up into heaven to be with God. And we also believe that the Bible teaches us not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well, which we'll see, tells us that Jesus will return from heaven that he will return to earth in one way, shape, or form. These things are not debated. They're throughout all of Scripture. If you are a Christian, you are saying that you believe these things. Some people, however, have developed all sorts of different theologies. Some separate the separate coming of Jesus from the rapture event, right? Some of you have heard a lot of terms like premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. What's the order of events? Is the thousand-year reign of Christ going to be literal or figurative? Is Jesus going to come back before the seven-year tribulation or after the seven-year tribulation? I don't know. There's lots of theories. But here's the facts, friends. We just don't have a calendar in here where at the end, it would have really convenient, actually, if uh, in, in, in the Apostle John's vision, he said, oh, and by the way, here's a schedule, <laughs> right? Revelation 21, new heaven, new earth, no more crying, no more pain, no more tears, and oh, by the way, here's what you can expect. But he didn't. So let me just say something that Scripture, I highly doubt, my opinion, if you disagree, that's fine, I highly doubt that the rapture and the second coming of Christ will include all of us disappearing instantaneously and cars crashing off the road and planes crashing out of the sky. I hate to burst your bubble, it probably won't be like a movie, okay? Uh, it'll probably be much more amazing than a movie. And let me tell you why. Revelations 21 tells us that the... the the earth is not just going to explode and be destroyed, but in fact, it will be restored into a new creation. Romans 8, the Apostle Paul tells us that all of creation is in birth pains, which signifies that new life is coming, right? So it's not just going to be this cataclysmic destruction event, but Scripture actually tells us that new life is coming, rebirth is coming, new and exciting things are happening. Look at what Paul tells the Colossian church in Colossians chapter 3. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, 
where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, like we talked about. Verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For Verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And then verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So here's a clue. This event, when Jesus returns, we also will be made into our heavenly beings, into who God has designed us to be when Christ returns. Okay, so pretty good. We're not going to disappear. In fact, we're going to be transformed. That's pretty good, right? And he says it again to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, he writes this. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. So we don't believe necessarily we're just going to disappear magically, but in fact, what Scripture teaches is that you and I will be made whole. We will be made as God intended us to be. That's an encouraging thought. See, Paul, in this letter to the Thessalonians, is not teaching some new doctrine of a magical event where all of us fly up in the air like superheroes, which would be cool. But he's actually consistently teaching the churches in the first century that there will be an event that happens where we are all made new, where we are restored, where we are made to be the people God intended us to be. Those who are dead will rise in glory, and then those who are still alive, whenever this event does happen, will be changed. So what we're saying here as Christians, what Paul is getting at in 1 Thessalonians 4 is that Christ died, Christ rose, Christ ascended, he will return, and when he returns, as he promised, you and I will be made new. He will gather his church together. But there's a tricky part here about this verse because Paul uses language he doesn't use anywhere else. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 that we just read, it says that we will be caught up the Greek sort of can also be translated like to, to be snatched, right? It would be caught up together, like grabbed possessively. So to say we will all disappear is a little tough out of one verse, right? Um, let me explain this another way. In the Bible, when we're studying the Bible, if there's something that's only in one verse, it's sort of hard and not really wise, I think, to define our whole theology over one verse, right? We want to look at the whole picture of what the scriptures say. We want to look at the whole story of God, the whole teachings of Jesus, the whole teachings of the Apostle Paul to have a well-rounded understanding of what's happening. So yes, we can look at this and say, okay, maybe Jesus is going to come down on a big cloud floating halfway between here and heaven and we're going to fly up like superheroes. Maybe. Or maybe scripture has more to say on this. Um, and so as I'm looking at this, one of the things I've come to terms with in my own study is that if I were to just look at this, I would say, okay, that seems pretty logical. But then when I look at all of Scripture, we see a, a picture that's a little bit different and maybe not quite so literal as us being snatched up by some giant heavenly hand that comes down from heaven, okay? Um, so many scholars actually believe that the Apostle Paul is not coming up with this language from nowhere. They actually, the Apostle Paul is drawing on Old Testament language from his training as a Pharisee, okay? Um, when he says in verse 16 of, of this text, just before this, that there will be a trumpet, a loud command, voice of an archangel, all these things, um, this is not new. In Exodus chapter 19, it says this. Exodus chapter 19. Oh, one passed. There you go. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and with a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses held, led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So during the Exodus, this is how God gathered his people to him to then reveal to them the Ten Commandments and God's will for them, right? So here, when Paul is talking about a loud trumpet blast, he's talking about in a way that God called his people to him, into his presence. Okay, that sounds pretty good, right? Paul also uses similar language borrowed from Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 says, In my vision at night, Daniel's vision, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. So in this Old Testament prophecy, the prophet Daniel says he saw a vision of God returning to collect 
his people into his presence. It is most likely that in Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul is not talking about some crazy supernatural event where some heavenly hand comes down and snatches us from earth, but rather drawing on the Old Testament texts and understanding of people that God will call us back to him. We don't know exactly what it'll look like. We don't know exactly how it's going to take place, but we know that God is coming back to call us to him. Now, would it be great to like suddenly start levitating up to heaven and, and, and float up like a superhero and then join God in heaven and everyone singing Kumbaya? Yes. Will that happen? Likely not. Because Scripture tells us that actually those who are still alive, those who remain, will be changed. We will be made whole. And it seems to me much more likely that here, the Apostle Paul is drawing on Old Testament language that he knew and understood to try to explain to people that God is drawing his people back to him. And that is the priority. And, and, and here's the issue, though. We look at this book, and it's full of stuff that's kind of hard to understand. And we read 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 and hear about the trumpet blast and, the, and, and, and floating up to God and what's going to happen and how do we deal with this and what do we do. And the problem is, is it creates confusion. And it creates confusion not because this book was made to create confusion, but because you and I and our brains think, I have to understand. I have to know. I have to be sure. <laughs> Friends, this book, I'm very passionate about this because I've spent my life studying this book. Um, this book is not meant to create confusion. This book does not have some secret numerical code for the privilege to find out and understand when Jesus is coming back. That's not the point. The point of this book is that you and I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, would read, would learn, would grow together in wisdom, would grow together in the knowledge of the Lord, would grow together in how to love and serve other people, that we would be encouraged and unified and grow together in this life. This is not some secret code to be cracked but it is to be read and shared in community together. This book is a gift from God to bring understanding and grace into our lives. And so when I say that now, thinking about all that stuff about the rapture and the Old Testament and everything, I want to look again at our text plainly in light of the other things we've discussed and see what we can do and what we can learn going forward from this day and this moment. So let's start just looking at verse 13. The Apostle Paul tells the people, we do not want to be misinformed and have no hope. Friends, we have hope. We have hope. There, we should not be like those who are misinformed and have no hope about the future because, yes, there is death, there is loss, there is pain, there is suffering. We've talked about this. But what hope do we have? Verse 14, we believe that Jesus died, rose, and ascended, as we already talked about, and we believe he will bring us and those who have died with him, that he will gather us all together. If you were confused, when he's talking about sleep here, he's talking about those who have died. But the Apostle Paul uses the word sleep because it's not permanent. For those who are in Christ Jesus, sleep or death is not permanent. That Christ will return and gather his children to him. We talked about this last week or the week before. We need to remember that you and I, we are eternal beings and we have hope. Verse 15, because according to God's word, we will not go first. Those who are sleeping will go first, and then God will return from heaven, verse 16, with a loud command or a trumpet. See, it's not going to be a surprise. There's not going to be some, all of a sudden, people next to us are going to disappear, and we think, oh, I missed it. What did I get wrong? Right? It's not what it's going to be like. There's going to be a loud command or a trumpet. And another way to think about this, if you're using Old Testament language, uh, in the ancient world, a loud command or a loud trumpet or a loud thing like this was to call all the people together to hear a royal decree. Imagine we're in medieval times and we're all living around a castle and you hear this loud trumpet blast. All the peasants then come to the castle to hear what the king would say. This is the language it's using. It's simple language that people would understand. There is going to be a loud trumpet and God is going to call all of his people to him. Those who are dead will rise. And as if that wasn't amazing enough, right? It says that all the dead will rise. And then there's this great verse, verse 17. 
that those who are left, we who are still alive, will be caught up together, snatched up together, grabbed together, whatever it is in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, what does this mean for us today? Will we fly? Maybe. <laughs> will we instantly disappear? Maybe. Will a giant hand come down and grab us? Maybe. I don't know. I really don't, you guys. But here's what I do know. Will we be in God's presence? Yes. Will we be in the glory of God? Yes. Will it be for all eternity and will you and I be transformed into the people God intended us to be without sin and without pain and without hurt? Yes, yes, yes. One of my favorite, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote a lot of great stuff and one of the things he said that if any one of us saw another person in the glory God intended them to be in, we would be tempted to worship them because they would seem so holy and amazing. Think about your neighbor who you can't stand, who makes all the noise, who's obnoxious, who does all these crazy things. C.S. Lewis says that if you saw that person in the glory of God and the way that God intended them to be, that person who annoys you so much, you would be tempted to bow and worship them because they would seem so glorious and so holy and so mighty. And Paul is telling the people that we will be transformed. And we know from all of Scripture that our hope our faith is in that this event will happen at some point, in some way, in some kind, but it's going to happen and it will be for eternity. And yet it's our human nature, it's our brains, our inside of us, every single one of us has this thing. We just want to know when, we just want to know how, we want the order of events, we want to put it on our calendar, we want to make sure it's scheduled. <laughs> but that's not the point. And let me just say very clearly, it's okay to believe or to know what you believe and why. It's okay to have an answer. It's okay to go into these things in Revelation and believe, well, I'm premillennial. Well, I'm postmillennial. Well, I'm am those are all fine things. But what we know and agree upon is that Jesus will return, and you and I, those who are followers of Jesus, will be in glory with him forever. Right? So for you and I, in our daily lives, what does this mean for us? What is the thing we need to do, and you see it right there, the title of this sermon is Encourage. How does Paul end this text? Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let people know there is a God who loves them and is calling them to him. Let people know there is a heavenly God who desires relationship and will return one day to make everything right again. You know what's funny about this? I thought about this analogy, and the analogy breaks down a little bit, but I thought about it, and I thought it was funny. Um, it's like God is inviting us to something, right? You ever been invited to a wedding? You get the little card, you know, steak or fish or chicken or fish or whatever, and you mark, okay, steak, I want steak, great. Um, how many of you actually worry, where's the steak coming from? Where's the chef trained? What's going to happen when I get there? What, what's the, hey, hey, you start worrying about, no, you just show up at the party, have a great time and enjoy the steak. So with God, let me encourage you, do the same thing. God has invited you to a banquet. He has invited you to eternity with him. Don't worry about how you're going to, you know, how it's going to be, the order of events and everything. Just know it's going to be there and it's going to be good. Because you know what? Not a single one of us, and I know this sounds a bit morbid, but stay with me here. Not a single one of us is promised tomorrow. Right? Who can guarantee and assure me that they will wake up tomorrow morning? Not a single one of us. This event could happen. Tragedy could happen. We just don't know. We just don't know. And some people feel, you know, if there's no promise of tomorrow, then we should get everything done today. Right? What can we get done? How can I get things done today? How can I set things up? How can I plan? How can I prepare? How can... I disagree. And I think this is scriptural. If tomorrow's not promised, which it's not, then all we have is today. Why would you rush through the day? Why would you waste time and energy worrying about tomorrow if all we have is today with one another, with the people we love, with our neighbors? Why ruin today for something we may never even get to tomorrow? Right? That's where the encouragement is in these words that Jesus will return, the dead will raise, we will be made new, we will be transformed, we will be changed, and that is where we find rest and peace and hope. We have hope. We are not like those who fear death. 
So focus on today and encourage one another with the joy you have. That's why it's just so good how he finishes this. Therefore, in light of all of this stuff, in light of trumpets and archangels and, and clouds and heavens and, and, and all these things disappear, whatever, encourage one another with your hope. Build one another up. He's not giving us a timeline. Remember, Paul didn't know either. Jesus said, I don't know, when he was on earth, remember? I don't even know. Only my Father in heaven knows. What makes us think we can figure it out? <laughs> Again, you, it's not that you're not special, okay? Um, you are special. Jesus loves you. But, but this just isn't for us to know. We don't have, it's okay to know. It's okay to research. It's okay to look. It's de- you know, great. But when I look at this text, when I look at the, what Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians 4 especially, he's not talking about, hey, go figure this event out. He's saying, take the truth of this and the hope this brings you and go and encourage your neighbor because this world needs encouragement. This world needs hope because a lot of people are scared of tomorrow. And we don't have to be. For those of you who are Christians, we can stand and say, we have hope and we are not afraid. For those who may not be Christians, for those who are wondering, for those who are checking this stuff out, this is sort of an insider sermon. Sorry about that. (laughs) Like, this is weird. If you're not a Christian or you're joining us online and you're thinking, this is weird. Yeah, it is. But it's hope and it's faith. And so for us, brothers and sisters, let us go and encourage one another. Let us build one another up and let us encourage one another with the truth and the hope that we have found. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thanks. Um, Lord, we pray to you because you are a God who loves us. And and beyond that, Father, you have also promised us that you will return. That you have not left us in our hurt and our pain and our questions, Father, but that you are coming back to gather us to you. Lord, thank you. Father, as we learn patience, as we learn to wait, I pray that we would learn to live in the moment to live for today, to encourage, to do whatever you've said in front of us. Father, I pray that this would be something that helps free us from anxiety, helps free us from worry, and that each and every day we would wake up, thank you for that gift, and then seek to go and encourage others with the hope we have found. Lord, give us the Holy Spirit to give us discernment and wisdom for how to do this, to give us courage to know where to go, and let us walk with you until you return. Lord, you are good. And for all these things, we praise your name and give thanks. Amen.